Anything we don't get through in this, you're still responsible for. And those of you guys that like to listen to my funny stories, I'll post an old recording for you. So as it relates to respiratory system, right? This one's kind of really important, right? That whole breathing thing, kind of necessary for life. I don't know. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, one of its major functions, of course, is allowing us to do gas exchange and therefore um, respire aerobically. So our head, our neck, though, help in transmitting this um, to the lungs. <coughs> But along the way, we actually are going to regulate the temperature of the air that we inhale and the water content. And this is why, you know, in some areas, um, in, in the movies and such, um, I can't remember the name of it, but they were like trapped somewhere up on some mountain and they were, um, they couldn't breathe. And one of the problems is the higher altitude, but the other problem is the cold, right? Um, and so it's hard to maintain the temperature of the air that we need to breathe and the moisture content that's necessary for breathing to be possible. So frogs, they have lungs, but they can also breathe through their skin and they primarily do that. What do you notice about their skin? It's wet, it's moist. They actually produce mucus um, on their skin to allow that gas exchange to happen. Moisture is necessary for that gas exchange to happen. So that's one of the primary um, jobs of your nasal passages is actually to warm and moisturize your air that you breathe. It is also to filter the air, right? So you have numerous hairs and you have mucus to <coughs> trap any of the microbes that you're inhaling. You're actually supposed to breathe through your nose although you can breathe through your mouth, right, if your nose is obstructed. Um, but it is actually more healthy and better for you to breathe through your nose because your nose is doing an important process of making sure that that air is cleaner, warm, and moist. The unfortunate thing about our nose, though, is that it's linked to the inner cavities of our skull, known as your sinuses. Um, and those can fill up with fluid when you have inflammation, when you have infection in that area, or allergic response like myself. And that's why your voice changes, because your voice resonates through those open cavities in your skull. And so that's why you, you can know by someone's voice right, how, how they sound, um, because the resonance changes as that area is filled with fluid during inflammation. The other problem, too, is that your nose and your inner ear are connected via your stationary tubes, right? So they drain into the back of your nose, and if for some reason they're blocked, right, fluid can stay in the inner ear, and you can have infection um, there, which can be quite painful because then it's pushing against the tympatic membrane um, of the ear. Sometimes if infection is let go, right, and um, it can cause that because um, it can't drain into the nose, it'll bust out the eardrums, right? Um, so not something you necessarily want happening because then you have the inner ear exposed two ways, <laughs> right? So then the lower respiratory, right, in our chest region is our lungs and the trachea and the bronchioles that lead to um, the alveoli where the gas exchange actually happens in the air sacs. So we've talked about this earlier in, in uh, immunology, right, how important this natural defense that we have that we're born with our mucosal escalator, right? So where is that? It's in the lower respiratory, right? In your trachea, in your bronchioles. And what is it made up of? Cilia, right? That move what? The mucus that you produce, right? So it's, it's a two-part system. You have goblet cells that produce the mucus, 
and you have ciliated cells that beat to move the mucus to the throat and then swallow it. Acids and enzymes in the stomach hopefully destroy the microbes and move it out of our system through the digestive system. What parts of our respiratory system are normally free of bacteria? We don't have normal microbiota that are associated with it. Your lungs, right? Normally, right, you don't have any microbes there. If there are microbes there and they're not destroyed, you have a potential of infection. Where else? Your middle ear, right? Your sinuses, as we said. So your nasal um, cavity, your nasal pharynx, right, the part of your throat associated in the throat itself are colonized by numerous bacteria. Other sites are sterile. So also your eyes, remember, are connected to your nose via your tear ducts. Your tears are continually washing your eyes, and that goes into your nose, right, down through the digestive system. So your middle ear, your sinuses, your trachea, your bronchioles, right, the alveoli, the lungs themselves, normally do not have microorganisms there. If you do, you have infection, you have disease. What's the most important opportunistic pathogen that commonly inhabits our nose? We talked about this one last time on how you don't want to sneeze or breathe on your cultures because you probably have it. It's a staph. Which one? Staph aureus. Yep, Staph aureus. So this lists several normal microbiota, right, that uh, most people um, could potentially be har harboring in their throat and their nasal passages. It's when they get other places then we run into problems. So strep throat. Um, streptococcal uh, pharyngitis, uh, we'll talk about diphtheria, pink eye, earache and sinus infections, how all that's linked together. Uh, for viruses, we'll talk about the common co cold and um, adenoviral uh, pharyngitis. Itis just means what? Inflammation, right? Usually referred to an anatomical area. Um, you have to be more specific as to what's um, causing the infection. So um, both strep throat and diphtheria will affect the throat, but they do have distinctive characteristics that will help you differentiate one from the other. Now, um, when you look into the back of the mouth, into the throat region, right before the throat you have what's referred to as your soft palate. Part of the soft palate um, hangs down. This is referred to as a uvula. If you have kids and you've watched Monster House, right, the uvula was even in Monster House. That's pretty cool. I'd love that anatomical reference. This is not your tonsil. It's part of your soft palate. Your soft palate, what it does is when you swallow food and drink, it blocks your nasal pharynx, so stuff doesn't go up your nose, it goes down instead, right? Just like your epiglottis blocks off your trachea so that you don't um, drink into your lungs or eat food into your lungs, right? So we block off our lungs so air just goes there. Sometimes when you eat certain things, right, um, especially soda that um, can be um, bubbly, It'll like, you'll feel it in the back of your nose because it really is going up the back of your nose, right? So in this picture is a healthy throat. This one, not so much. And in this case, because they're inflamed, right, 
and they're really looking down the throat here, you can see pus and swelling to the palatine tonsils, right? And this could be um, due to something like strep throat or some other throat infection, maybe even diphtheria. So what's the differences um, for these guys? Well, they're caused by two totally different bacteria. Strep throat is caused by streptococcus pyogens. Carinibacterium diphtheria as the causative agent of diphtheria. Uh, with strep throat, it's usually very unmistakable <laughs> that this is what's wrong because um, the throat is very sore. Usually it's very difficult to swallow. Where with diphtheria, um, people experience a much milder sore throat. You can recover from strep throat without treatment, although it's not advised. Um, because many complications can happen from um, this type of infection. It can uh, cause problems in other parts of the body. There are many numerous um, virulence factors, right? Bad ways in which it, it, it evades our immune system. And we'll look at a few of those in a moment. The scary thing about diphtheria is the toxin that's produced is deadly. Right? Um, so this is a toxin producer. The type of toxin it produces an, is an AB toxin, which means it has two parts to it. The B part binds specifically to our cells, and then the A part is what is actually toxic. The bacteria itself is not invasive, right? It tends to kind of stay in the, in the uh, throat area. It doesn't go to other parts of the body. But the toxin definitely does. The primary reservoir is humans, right? So we don't have to really worry about contact with animals as it relates to this infection. It's mainly um, animals. They say um, Streptococcus pyogens is human only. There are some people that are anal carriers of this, right? Which means that they can have the infection in the anus. Right, and spread it to others that way. So it's all about um, how sanitary you are. Right? That's all about the why you wash your hands after going to the bathroom. There's no vaccine for strep throat. Uh, one of the problems with that is the changes that that bacteria go through. Um, just can't uh, develop an effective vaccine. Uh, but the good news is um, treat with, with antibiotics, and typically we do this after we've confirmed it with culture, right? We've, we've grown the uh, bacteria. Nowadays, though, we can do it even quicker. We can do the rapid strep test, um, which uses antibodies right in the doctor's office in a little snap kit um, and to detect the presence of that particular bacteria. And so um, we can diagnose and treat much faster than in the past. They'll still send a swab usually off to the lab, especially if you come up negative, because there is a sensitivity issue with the test, right? Um, it's not going to pick up every little minute thing, uh, but usually pretty good infection. They're gonna, it's going to be detected by that test. Um, but they'll back it up with culture. Um, so they'll take a swab, and they'll stick it in a tube, and they'll send it off to a lab. When I was a kid, they would rub it right on a blood auger plate right there in the office in front of you. Um, for diphtheria, you can get an infection of the skin with diphtheria, although typically it's the throat. Um, the vaccine that we have against this is a toxoid vaccine, because again, the real problem with this one is the toxin. So what they give you as a weakened form of the toxin to help protect you against the toxin if you're exposed. And for treatment, we can give you anti-serum, antibodies against the toxin. And again, this is one of the things that we can get from you when you donate blood, right? Because in your serum are these antibodies, and they can be taken out um, and used to help people. Um, and antibiotics will be given right away, even before culture, because um, they're not going to want to wait to find out. They want to get rid of this infection right away. Uh, what other disease that we talked about do we give you a toxoid vaccine against? It's actually combined with this vaccine. Tetanus. Right? You usually get tetanus and <coughs> diphtheria together. It's called the TDAP now. T for tetanus, D for diphtheria, and AP 
for the acellular vaccine against per peritosis, um, commonly re referred to as whooping cough. Um, at one time, uh, they weren't giving that third vaccine, that third um, vaccine in in with diphtheria in tetanus. They've instituted that in I don't know the last five or six years because we had serious reoccurrences, um, lack of vaccination for whooping cough, and part of the reason at one time that vaccine was spiking high fevers in children. And so, you know, moms were calling the doctor's office, even though the doctor said he's probably going to get a fever, it's okay, it's because of the vaccine, he's not sick, it'll go away. They still panicked, moms do this, right? And doctors got pissed off and got tired of dealing with psycho moms and dads and stopped giving the vaccine until they improved the vaccine so that that side effect didn't happen. And so that those changes have been made um, you don't get the high fever like you used to with that vaccine. Um, but because of that, we have this gap of people that were not vaccinated, um, and we've got to try and fill that gap. So, you know, information from the CDC's website, right, a lot of these things are reportable diseases. Um, and you can see that the trend has significantly uh, reduced because of vaccination, right? We really haven't seen any problems with it. Um, a probable case of non-fatal respiratory diphtheria with a positive PCR, which means I actually looked at the DNA, um, test for the diphtheria toxin gene, was reported in an inadequately immunized adult male with a history of AIDS, right? So they had a, they, they had a compromised immune system, so even now we wouldn't be able to give them the vaccine, right, because their immune system is compromised. Um, so it puts them at greater risk for developing infectious disease. Uh, let's see what I want to show you guys. So blood agar plates, um, streptococcus uh, pyrogens is beta hemolytic. It will completely lyse the red blood cells. Lots of different virulence factors. Streptococci, right, so it's in chains, right, cocci in chains under the microscope. <coughs> so another scary list, not quite as long as the potentials for Staph aureus, right, but still pretty um, impressive. Notice it can inhibit attachment of phagocytic cells by destroying um, C5A, right, so they actually stop that complement chemoattractant from working. Um, inhibits phagocytosis, aids in the prevent, uh, penetration of the epithelium, um, the type of capsule that it has. It has M protein, which stops um, C3B from binding and opsonizing. So, you know, it's really good at evading our immune system. We talked about this before, too, on how it can coat itself in our own um, antibodies. It can grab onto the FC portion of IgGs. Um, it can produce super antigens. Um, these are responsible for some of the side effects that you can see sometimes, like scarlet fever, um, which remember we talked about, you know, that's, that was listed in the rashes, um, skin rashes for viruses, um, but it's not viral. It's actually a toxin um, effect of staphyl some strains of staphylococci uh, pyogens. Um, and some of them can actually produce um, toxic shock from their toxins um, and can actually cause uh, flesh-eating uh, fasciitis where it literally just the toxins just eat away at your cells and kill them and eat away at your tissue. Uh, so pretty, pretty ugly bug, right? Don't want to mess with this one. Hence why the throat is not happy. So for diphtheria, as I said, the problem with this one is the toxin it produces. That toxin specifically attaches the B portion to our cells and then gains en entry, and the A component is actually the active component of that toxin. We're going to treat right away with this one. <coughs> so erythromycin is in a group of drugs called the macrolid antibiotics, and they slow the growth or sometimes kill sensitive bacteria by 
reducing the production of important proteins needed by the bacteria to survive. So what is the term used to describe inhibition of growth when we talk about anti uh, bacterial antibiotics? Anyone know? Bactericidal means death. Bacterial static means inhibit. So what, what is this antibiotic binding to if it's interfering with protein synthesis? What makes proteins in our cells? You said it. Ribosomes, right? Ribosomes. Ooh, I'm stretch this morning. <laughs> so the parts of our upper respiratory tract that's commonly infected by streptococcus pneumoniae and hemophilus influenza, and these are both bacteria, right? Um, so these are the ones that can cause problems with things like uh, pink eye and inner ear and sinus, sinus, sinus infections. Um, Mycobac mycoplasma pneumoniae, which is a uh, bacteria that doesn't have a cell wall, right? So we can't use penicillin against it. Streptococcus pyogens and Staph aureus. But viruses can also cause problems even in the middle ear. And this is where we really run into problems too because I don't know about you, but uh, there's no way they're going to get a sample of your middle, middle ear, right? Right? There's no way we can swab the middle ear and figure out what's up in there, right, <laughs> to be able to treat. So a lot of times, unfortunately, it's a guessing game um, when it comes to that particular area of the body. It can cause some really um, serious complications. The problem with pink eye is there are some bacteria and viruses um, that can attach the conjunctiva, right, the, um, our eyelids, and um, cause infection. What in our tears usually helps us with bacterial infection? What substance in our tears usually helps us combat bacterial infection? IgA, yep, one more. It's actually an enzyme that can digest peptidoglycan. Lysozyme, lysozyme, lysozyme. So again, these are usually um, bacteria that are resistant to that or viruses. Um, and then, of course, the whole problem with the nose linking the sinuses, right? Stuff can he head up there. And then the middle ear is also connected to the nose. So they do have a vaccine for hemophilus influenzae, and they were hoping that this vaccine would help... Um, establish immunity um, and stop a lot of childhood type ear infections because the problem with child's ears is that their stationary tubes aren't as pitched as an adult um, because their head is smaller. As you grow, right, as you mature, your head um, elongates and those tubes pitch more. Um, so if we potentially had um, vaccination, Im immunity to one of the major causes to um, uh, inner ear infections, they would hope that the, the incidence would go down. Unfortunately, it really has not. <laughs> um, it hasn't really um, come through to, to what we had uh, hoped. The data does not suggest um, that it's been effective, unfortunately. Because um, so many other things can cause those types of infections. Um, so we're just getting at one of the problems and not taking care of the rest. Uh, so amoxicillin is the most common antibiotic though that's given for those types of infections. So how do we avoid uh, the common cold? What's the most important thing for disease transmission? Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Um, there's a com commercial out there too that says you know, don't huddle up with people that are sick, right? It makes me giggle. Um, but it's true, right? Obviously, avoid sick individuals. Um, don't expose yourself to others when you're sick, right? 
Um, but the, the, unfortunately, we have that incubation period with infection where you don't know you're sick yet and you're spreading it, and that's how um, infection disease tends to continue in the population, right, because we can't um, always 100% um, avoid exposure. So the, the distinctive characteristic of adenopharyngitis, anyone know? Although this is a viral infection of the throat, which usually you're not going to get neutrophil type inflammation, right? But you do for this particular virus. You can get pus on the tonsils in the throat, and you can have a pretty strong fever, um, which is not usually something we see with a virus. We had, a vac we had a vaccine against this that used to be utilized, but is no longer um, given. Why they stopped utilizing it, I don't know. The good or you can consider it the bad news um, is that when it comes to viruses, is there any treatment? No. There are some antivirals out there for some viruses that can help, but for the most part, you're relying on your immune system, right? So that's somewhat good, right? You don't have to take drugs. <laughs> the bad news is you're relying on your immune system, and if your immune system fails, right, that's where it can be dangerous. So for, I thought I changed this slide. I don't know. I swear I'd change it. There's one um, objective for Legionnaire's disease that I want to go over with you guys because most of the time you guys miss it. Um, and I thought I had added it in here. I guess maybe I opened the wrong PowerPoint today, which means I need to make sure I post the right one for you guys. Or it didn't save. Nope, yep, I opened the wrong one. There we go. That would explain why some of the things I was looking for weren't there. Tuberculosis, and we've kind of talked about tuberculosis before. There it is. Okay, there it is. Right. So um, we're not going to cover um, the rest of this list, um, but what I what I want you guys to go over on your own, right, are um, about the different pneumonias and how you can tell the difference between them. Paratussis, we talked uh, a little bit about, right? That's whooping cough. Um, tuberculosis, we've kind of mentioned in the past too, so that's kind of a little bit of a review. And then the one important thing, and we've had some outbreaks of Legionnaires um, in New York. They had a um, ventilation system, air conditioning system that was contaminated for several buildings with Legionnaires. And it's named after the fact that when they discovered it, there was a Legionnaires conference, and a whole bunch of them got infected. Uh, so that's how it got that name. Um, it is a bacteria that grows, I think, in an amoeba, of all things. So why do you think it was difficult for re researchers to determine the causative agent? Well, if it grows in an amoeba, who's going to think to check that, right? How are you going to do that? And they actually had to develop special artificial media to be able to grow this bacteria and be able to study it. So the problem in the beginning with this one and figuring out what was causing this infection was the ability to be able to study the organism, to be able to grow it in artificial culture. So the problem with that, too, is because it took us a while to kind of figure out, okay, what's causing this infection? What is this? Um, and we had to develop techniques to be able to, to diagnose, right, uh, infection. So that took some time. And so... The question is, when we look at the epidemiology, when we look at the incidences of, of Legionnaire's disease, is it really increasing in incidence, or were people sick in the past and we just didn't know what they were sick with because we could not detect or that they had Legionnaire's disease? So how are we going to find out this answer? Right? How do we know if it's truly increasing 
or we've just got better at detecting? How are we going to figure out this? How do we figure out anything? As scientists, we continue to research it, right? Time will tell us this answer, right? As time continues to go on, if the numbers continue to increase, yeah, we've got a problem with this infectious disease, right? That we need to figure out prevention, you know, maybe vaccination, you know, where we need to go, right? But as we continue to gather data over time, right, these answers are going to be teased out for us. This is what epidemiologists like Dr. Retard, I'm really bummed that he did not come. <laughs> um, you know, this is the type of work that they do, right, is to gather this information, analyze this data, and help us as a population know how to respond to these infectious diseases that we're dealing with, right? Okay, so please go over, right, um, the pneumonias and the paratussis and the uh, tuberculosis, and I will post an old lecture for you guys as well. Those of you guys that were late, I highly, highly suggest listening to the first part of my lecture. I know. Yesterday was worse, though. Yesterday was torrential on the way in. Okay, I posted the right one for you guys. I just opened up the wrong one for me. <laughs> That's good to know.